And the other thing I want to say is welcome to Michael, um, who is uh, making a film um, about the higher education um, sector as a result of changes, and he just wanted some shots and uh, sent it. sets out that there's going to be a, a slightly lower reduction in funding to 2011-12, which means that uh, the, the subsequent three years will be much steeper. I don't really know what this will mean for Roehampton at this stage. It's still too early to know. We'll get our grant letter uh, at the end of February. We're talking about the universities and this one in particular yeah. and the current situation. And walking over here just now, actually, having made some notes about an hour ago, I'm adding to them. I was thinking of a bunch of words um, which sort of come at the top of my head about attitudes to the situation. And they would be worry, sadness, anger, and a certain sort of re-energizing at the same time. Worry, I think, um, for our students and the sort of opportunities that are going to be available for them in the future and the type of students we can bring in. Concerns for colleagues and staff um, about the possibilities to do what they want to do in universities like this, um, sadness and anger in relationship to things that we feel are important about what a university can do and what it should be doing and how this is um, denigrated in all sorts of ways, how there is ignorance at large. I've been in, been in education for an embarrassingly long time and in that whole period I think this is by far the most severe and prolonged crisis of education that I have seen, there are two really incompatible and contradictory versions of education which are now fighting it out. The right wing version is education for the economy, the left wing version is education for society. And at the same time, a certain sort of weirdly re energization, which comes, um, it's come through departmental committee meetings about thinking through new possibilities of doing what we do reconstructing our courses, even reinventing the university, applying our thinking again to the value of thinking as such, which is what we do here, the value of critical practice. I think emotion is a good place to start because, uh, I mean, uh, I think, certainly I've been through sort of emotional sort of transitions in this period. Um, I was interviewed for the BBC for the Brown Review, um, uh, the day the Brown Review came mm. out. And, they, they asked me a question uh, which they didn't actually use in the broadcast, but you know, they said, what's your single biggest emotion? You know, is it anger, frustration? And I thought for a bit, and just for a split second, you, know, you have to sort of say something on TV, and I said, no, it's bewilderment. Because I cannot see any, I cannot see any good rationale for doing what is being done. Colleges and universities are contradictory places. Uh, and they pose the ruling of order with a certain dilemma, which is this, if the ruling order wants its skills and professional certifications and its ruling ideas, then it has to allow places to exist in which young people can simply talk to each other and read books and think about ideas, and occasionally drink, I suppose, um, and in certain political climates, that is bound almost to result in a certain kind of militancy, and there's not much the ruling order can do about that, this is its dilemma, as long as it needs those professional skills and values and ideas and so on. And as you know very well, there are times when that can lead to, uh, to, to a, a very militant climate within the universities. I do think there is the potential for this to be another 1968. I don't, I don't mean in, you know, in terms of action on the street necessarily, uh, though that is, is an, another interesting feature, that, that a parallel. Um, but I think in the way that this could lead to a cultural shift in, inside the academy. I don't want to get all weepy and nostalgic about the late 1960s and you know, burst out with the kinks and all that. You know. um, but of course what happened there, astonishingly, and it's pretty rare, was that the academia became briefly and explosively the catalyst for a much wider social movement. And all the conditions for that being now reproduced 
not all of them, but some of them, vital conditions seem to be seem to be uh, brewing up again. What happened in, in that period was that it was clear that universities were centres of critique. They'd always been pulled, this is why there's some contradictory places, between being integrated into the status quo and serving the status quo, but at the same time holding it at a certain arm's length, not least in the humanities, in the critical disciplines, and subjecting it to a certain critique. And what happened in that period was that the balance tipped well and truly on the side of critique, and of course, what ruling orders find very hard to 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 to, to, to absorb, what they find what they're very fearful of are alliances of intellectuals and workers. When, as briefly happened that period, intellectuals and working people come together, that's a very difficult combination for the order to handle. I, I you know I accept that there was going to be a reduction in funding for universities. I knew that was going to happen. But the way it was done by removing all funding for teaching of arts, humanities, yeah. and social sciences, I, I find quite shocking. Um, because I think there is, there is an ideology behind that. I think it's very flawed thinking again. Um, uh, that you know, only certain subjects contribute to the economy. Well, we know it's just that's not, yeah, that's it's true. It's not just a creative economy. What's momentous now is that capitalism can't afford to educate a younger generation. Um, why not? I mean, doesn't it have the resources? Don't we have the resources? Of course we have the resources. But resources to educate everybody several times over for free. But to commandeer those resources, we would, of course, need socialism. So what has happened in our time, what's happening right now, is that the relation between the welfare and well-being of a whole generation of people and the necessity of socialism has become much more obvious than it's been for many decades. But, I mean, don't you think there's a sense in which, you know, the government is trying to do some sort of shock doctrine thing? I mean, in the sense that they're sort of, you know, um, there's a year of, where they pull funding before the fees come in. So it's like the universities have a year to prove themselves, you know, to sink or swim. But yeah. then it's an ideological feeling because, in a sense, what they're saying is, you know, they want there to be a few elite universities and basically that the only people who can you know, who should study these things, serious subjects, will be the people, the kind of people who used to study them. Hi, uh, my name is Ben, uh, and I'm a student at Oscar Pike, uh, University College London. I was on a talk show with America earlier on the radio, and all the students there that were on this talk show were saying, the students in the United Kingdom are an inspiration to us all. We were in um, King's Cross earlier, actually, and also we did a big teach up there, and the amount of people that were grabbing us on the salt shoulder, the random people just on their way home from work, 50 year old men in suits saying, well done. Keep fighting. We're really starting to build something in this country, and we're going to bring this government down by the end of the year. Politicians can make pledges, but I think we can make pledges too. There's a phrase that's quite famous, uh, probably for all the wrong reasons, but it says something very simple. It said, protest is saying that I disagree with something. Resistance is saying that I will not let this happen. With a lot of the sort of London um, broadcasting intelligentsia uh, are very much out of step with the non-London parts of the country. I am a localist. I believe passionately in devolving power to the local level as much as possible. The example that I've given many times is that uh, Birmingham... Out Um, and you know, walking into um, 
the LSE about a week ago. Well, we're not walking, sort of sneaking. Um, uh, you, you saw, I saw um, Jeremy Hunt's face when you know 60 students came onto the stage shouting and stamping and you know saying shame on you and he was really frightened. You can see it um, in the videos if you play it back. Then he, he tries very hard to regain his composure, but he's really really shaken. Are you really a free and fair arbiter of the decision to hand Rupert Murdoch unprecedented control of the UK media? Will you please answer this one question honestly, without the spin, and then we will wait for you outside and allow you to continue? The Secretary of State is very happy indeed to answer your question, but no chanting. It's not a football match. Okay. You asked me if I'm a fair arbiter to make this decision. Uh, the answer is yes, I am. I think that the, the student riots are definitely, they've terrified the government. And, um, but what, what will really bring this country to a halt and where the real power lies is when these trade union leaders are talking about coordinated action, the students need to be spreading the spirit of their movement so that that turns into the reality of a general strike because that's what can bring down this government. I'd like to ask you, Paul, to the extent that we are threatened, what might be threatened here? The ways we do things, the type of students we take, the, the range of subjects we feel that we can continue to teach, the nature of our whole project. The advantage of the current system uh, of funding is that we have a block grant from Hefke, which means you can cross subsidise. That cross subsidy ceases to exist very, very soon. Um, so, you know, I have to say, well, Joe, you know, you're doing terribly well in drama, so I'm going to take some of that from you and, and, uh, and, uh, with that philosophy, <laughs> you see, uh, and, uh, although, you know, uh, or, 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 or modern languages or, or the human rights undergraduate program, you know. Uh, so I think there is a limit to what you can do to that, and I think you have to be very, very clear that what you're doing is for strategic reasons. When the humanities first emerged, as we know them, they emerged at exactly the same time as early industrial capitalism. And the humanities, of which academia was a centre, served partly as a kind of place in which values expelled from early industrial capitalist society, creative, imaginative values, could, as it were, take shelter, could be nurtured, could flourish. Therefore, academia, at least partly in the good times, could be that kind of place. What I think we've seen in our time, and it's a momentous historical development, is the final death of that lineage of the humanities, of academia, of higher education as critique, the final integration into the priorities of the system. What we have to assert against that is the value of education for society, the value of education for community, for personal self-development, and that idea which capitalism finds it impossible to wrap its mind around, education simply as a value in itself. Thank you. you say you um, Rampton will survive, and I, I certainly hope so, and committed to that as well. And I imagine all of us in this room are. Do you think Rampton will change significantly in this coming time? 